What's good, Detroit Sports Nation? I am Eric Vincent, your host here at the DSN News Desk. Back again to chop it up with you, the best fan base in the world. I appreciate your time and support. And you know it's time to talk a little teal night with the Detroit Pistons. Uh, they just finished up their game uh, on a back-to-back -back game night against the Atlanta Hawks. And a nasty 136-112 to finish. Well, the game has started off with so much energy and so much excitement. It really just ended on a sour note where I can't help but feel pretty disappointed in what I saw. It, it sucked, man. And before we peel into the layers of the box score and talk about the game, gotta give most respect as I possibly can to everybody at LCA that made the energy and the atmosphere what it was tonight, man. It was really cool seeing so many fans decked out in teal from head to toe. All the throwback teal jerseys that came out. A lot of the former players that rocked teal that were in the crowd from Lindsey Hunter, uh, Terry Mills. We know Grant Long is on the Valley Sports call, so shout out to Grant Long. It was really cool seeing a lot of the nostalgia come back. I mean, they showed, like, you know, videos of Jerry Stackhouse, you know, doing reverse dunks. And Grant Hill with his highlights. Jerome Williams, the junkyard dog, grabbing rebounds. You know, LCA did a great job tonight. The Pistons did an awesome job tonight. Even the current players. I like the swag that they wore with the green jerseys. Or the teal jerseys, excuse me. Oh, my gosh. Please don't get mad at me. <laughs> the teal jerseys. They're not green. The teal jerseys. I love what they did in the decor with them. They kept it clean. I like Cade's black sleeve. I like some of the shoes that they were rocking, like Dern's black headband. Some of that swag and some of that to kind of offset, you know, some of just the teal alone made it a little bit more bearable. So shout out to the fans. Shout out to the players. Shout out to everybody that made Teal Night what it was. Pretty awesome to see the display tonight at LCA. Now let's talk about the game. Man, listen. Again, it started off at such a high note, man. The Pistons were doing great in the first half, really doing a great job, and really matching bucket for bucket and possession for possession and run for run with the Atlanta Hawks. They were doing pretty good to kick things off, and things just kind of went south in the second half for a lot of reasons. And I really, you know what? No, I was going to get to a lot of other things with just the team. Let's get to my biggest issue with this game. K. Cunningham put on... An amazing performance. A career-high night, 35 points, 9 boards, 8 assists, only 1 turnover, took care of the ball extremely well, shot very efficiently, 14-23. And I'm still upset thinking that there was more that could have been done with his stats. And it's not because of him. It's not because of what he didn't do. It's this continuous, ongoing battle with the NBA officials. And I don't get it. I do not understand what NBA officials have against Kay Cunningham. I don't understand, man. This dude is literally, you know what? This is the third time through his career where you can make the legitimate argument that we were robbed of a 40-point performance by Kay Cunningham, by the refs. This is the third time you can legitimately make that argument throughout his career. Take it back to the Denver game. Uh, at home, where he put Jokic on skates, third, scored 34 points, played his behind off. That was another one of his first breakout games of last season as a rookie. He was getting smacked in the face by DeMarcus Cousins, tripped by Austin Rivers, you know, popped on his wrist on mid-range jumpers, and not a single call to send him to the free throw line. Remember, that game, he scored 34 points on all Field goals. Not a single free throw for him in that game. Absolutely disgusting. I've watched that game too many times in his highlights. And the calls that they just ignored made no sense. Take it to the Nets game. And that was in March, if I'm not mistaken, of last season, towards the end of the year, where he missed a good chunk of the second quarter, all the second quarter, actually, because he had the tailbone injury. He came back in the middle of the third and... And ended up scoring 34 points. I think he scored like 27 in that second half alone in the quarter and a half that he played. And again, if the refs were giving him the proper calls to the contact that he was getting, whether it was bumps from Kevin Durant, getting smacked by Andre Drummond, an elbow from Kyrie, whatever it was, they refused to give him the adequate number of calls. He went to the line like four times that game when he should have been there 10 at least. That's another game he should have had at least 40. And we are getting robbed of that because refs don't want to pick up the whistle for him. And what makes it even weirder, 
They were giving him favorable calls in the first half. He went to the line seven to eight times throughout the game, or hit seven of eight, went to the line eight times, shot pretty well. And you would think by how they were giving him calls in the first half that it would continue in the second, especially considering the contact got worse in the second half. He was getting hacked worse, and they refused to call it. We all saw the same plays, and we saw the biggest one, the worst one. Crossed over his defender in the third quarter, dunks on two Hawks, and they don't call anything. He gets smacked in his arm, gets bodied in the chest, and he gets flailed, and he knocks to the ground. And they don't call anything. It was a ref under the uh, hoop. It was a ref on the sideline to the left, and they didn't call anything for this man. He was just as visibly upset. He threw his arms in the air. He was clearly talking to the refs like, yo, what do I got to do? And we're all wondering the same thing. What do we have to do? Shout out to Ash and the trainer. I remember last season when I think they played either the Pelicans or the Bulls, and K got smacked in the face on a fast break layup, and the refs didn't call anything and just gave the ball to the Pistons. He recorded that on Twitter and put it out there like, yo, what do we got to do for a call, dog? Like, what do we got to do? And it's, it makes no sense at this point. Dwayne Casey was on the sideline yelling at the refs, but at this point, they need to take further action. Normally, when stars and players don't get adequate calls that the team thinks they deserve, they take footage from each game that they think the refs screwed up on, and they send it to the league to review. That needs to happen immediately. Because these calls that they are avoiding on Kay Cunningham make no sense. Again, he's a number one overall pick. Normally in the NBA history, number one overall picks get courted favor when it comes to the whistle. And we're not asking you to send him to the line 30 times on some James Harden type stuff. We're not asking for that. But my goodness, can you call the the obvious stuff? We're not, I'm not an NBA ref. And I feel like I could have did a better job than they did today. It's just absurd, man. Absolutely absurd seeing this kind of treatment that Cade's getting. We're going to get a petition out for you soon, Cade. We rally it for you, bro. We're going to do everything that we can. Crowd did a great job with the ref. You suck, Chance. They deserve that. Well done, crowd. They deserve every bit of that. I don't know how much more I can watch of that, man, but... <sighs> okay, outside of that, it was an awesome game by Cade. It was cool seeing him go off. It was cool to see him shoot efficiently, and it was cool to see him dominate in the areas that he's good at with that mid-range, getting to the hoop, and he was still playmaking as well. Um, spread the ball around, especially towards the second half. Again, he had 27 in the first half, finished the game with 35. Dished a lot to Bogey, who finished with 22. And he really tried to get a lot of his other guys involved. Um, Jaden Ivey was obviously on a bit of a pitch count. Um, wasn't his normal self. Didn't play a ton of minutes. Only played 23 minutes, scored 12 points. And, you know, again, from his first game back from the non-COVID illness he was dealing with, it was clear he was still dealing with something. And he gave it his best effort. It wasn't bad. He didn't play a horrible game, but you could clearly tell he wasn't 100%. And <laughs> he almost put down an alley-oop from Kane Cunningham in transition where he threw a little bit behind him and reached back and looked like he was about to yam and put it down. But unfortunately, it didn't happen. I was this close to jumping out of my house, man. <laughs> that would have put me on my behind. It was crazy. Um... And again, that that was that was cool to see some of those people blame us, but again, it was a lot of disappointment that happened in this game. And you know what? I want to pose the same question that we talked about in the last video too, because I'm getting to a point where I think I'm confident in where I think some changes are going to happen with the Pistons. We talked about this in the last video when we believe some changes are actually going to happen. A lot of you in the comment section talked to me, gave me some you know suggestions of what you thought were going to happen, when you thought the lineup was going to change, and there's a lot of intriguing ideas. There's a lot of stuff that I agreed with, some stuff I didn't agree with, but it was cool to see some of the feedback. Talk to me now. Let me know what you think is still after tonight's game. Because for me, I think by the 20 game mark this season, we're going to see some changes in this lineup. I think it's getting to that point at this point because the Detroit Pistons, <laughs> there's, there's two things that we know. The Pistons are a super young team. We didn't expect them to be able to win a lot because they're so young, because they're inexperienced. We weren't expecting them to be, you know, this dominant force in terms of winning already. So that's for one thing that we expected. Number two, 
based on their lineup and based on their roster, Pistons are trying a lot of things. They're trying a lot of things in terms of their development because they have players in different positions. They have new talent on the roster. So they're trying different things. So, for example, like Beef Stew playing the five but playing in a more oriented role where he's playing and shooting from the perimeter more than he did last season. If you remember last year, he wasn't shooting at all. So now that they're trying to make that the focal point of their development, it just shows that they're trying new things. And at this point, they need to add changing the lineup to the things that they try out. They need to try thinking about defensive switches in terms of their game plan and things that they try out. Because a lot of the soft switching that they do, a lot of the you know the lazy ability to get around and stick with their man and not be in a position where they're forcing and allowing mismatches, they need to be able to change some things like that. And it's getting sooner than later than it is to that point. Even with it being early, I think the Pistons are doing a disservice to themselves by not making some of these changes. You guys know my favorite one. Jalen Dern still needs to be that guy at the five. And I think you kind of saw it today. There was a play that Beef Stew had today. And even if you look at Beef Stew's box score, he didn't, if you look at his numbers, it wasn't a horrible game. 17 points, 8 rebounds, 6 of 11 from the field, 2 of 5 from 3. But there was one play that sticks out to me, and it was a putback that he had. I think it was either Jay Nivey or Cade, or actually might have been either, might have been Bogey, actually. They put up a layup, and Beef Stew cleaned it up in front of the rim with a soft putback layup with two hands. It was a nice play, and it was cool. But my thing is, if you're looking to make LCA one of those like energetic areas where it's hard for road teams to play against, you're missing a detonation dunk by Jalen Duran. where if he's putting that back, it's bringing the crowd out of their seat and it's getting them to go crazy. If you think about some of the biggest plays of the season, they've been dunks from Jalen Duran. When he dunked the transition against the Hawks last game and the crowd went crazy with that one-handed stuff he had. When he dunked on the Orlando Magic at opening night and the uh, fast break he had in the wing from Corey Joseph who dumped it off. The crowd went insane off of that. The team, this team especially, the crowd and the team, feeds off of energy. They feed off of excitement, and you're limiting it with a player like Beef Stew. By keeping him in the starting lineup, I don't care how many, unless he just gets Steph Curry hot from three, which is never going to happen this season, you're limiting your ability to have that kind of intangible factor play into the psyche and the development of this team. Those kind of little things, it might sound crazy, but those things make the world of a difference for a young team. I promise you. I'm telling you, I believe by the 20 game point, we're going to see some changes in the starting lineup, and it needs to start with Jalen Duran moving to the five. At this point, they're not winning with Beef Stew and where they at, and they're surrendering too many extra opportunities. They're getting outmuscled by these bigs that they keep playing against. It's not working to their favor, especially considering that Beef Stew is not giving you that kind of offensive production where that kind of defensive performance that they're suffering outweighs that negative. He's not giving you that. Jalen Duren has to be a starter within the next 20 games or by the 20 game mark. I'm counting. I'm waiting. I think it has to happen. Something else that very well could happen is what we talked about in the last video as well. Let me just ask you guys a question. Did anybody see Sadiq Bey play today? What did Sadiq Bey do today? What did Sadiq Bey do today? We just talked about these roller coaster performances from him where he's either playing really good, and honestly, a lot of those games where he's putting up those 20 and close to 30-point nights, they come into a lot of blowout performances. Now, granted, a lot of other Pistons do that as well, but for Sadiq doing it, it kind of is discouraging because in games where they need him and where he's playing to a par that's not satisfactory, it's more than likely, it's more common from what we've seen in games where the Pistons are right there. Even games like today, they were in this game for a while, and maybe a couple hits from Sadiq would have hopefully put them in a position where they could have took that lead or went on a bigger roll than they did. And it just wasn't happening, man. His inconsistencies are driving me crazy to watch. They're rough to watch, man, and I'm serious. I, a lot of people took me to task in the conversation about saying that he could be, you know, possibly coming off the bench if he doesn't improve. 
It's not too far of a stretch of the imagination, the stretch of an imagination where that's actually going to happen. Because for what he's trying to do as becoming as more of a well-rounded scorer and not just a spot-up shooter, that is more feasible coming off the bench based on what you have in the starting lineup already. Again, you don't need another ISO creator like Sadiq Bey, who's already not a great dribbler, not much of a playmaker. He's more reliable as a spot-up, catch-and-shoot, 3-and-D player. He needs to focus on that, and I wish he would start doing that because what he's doing, the same thing. Again, catching the ball from K on the wing, and then instead of just shooting the ball, you side dribble and then shoot a harder shot, or you step out of bounds, or you travel and waste a possession. It has to stop, man. It really has to stop. I'm telling y'all, 20 games, 20 games, I believe we're going to see some changes. It is not just going to be in the front court. I think we're going to see a lot of changes if the Pistons keep playing the way we keep seeing them play, man. They can't keep allowing these kind of games, surrendering damn near 150 points to your opponents. This can't continue. Talk to me in the comment section again. I'd love to hear your feedback. When do you think these changes are going to happen? How did you feel about tonight? What did you think about the teal jerseys? I'd love to hear your feedback about the Pistons action tonight. Make sure you like the video, subscribe to the channel to help us get closer and closer as we round over to 5,000 subscribers. Please make that happen for us. We're getting closer and closer to that milestone. Your support means everything in making that thing happen. We really appreciate you. Make sure you follow us on social media as well. Search us and follow on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Tap in and follow with Detroit Sports Nation. And, of course, follow me as well at I am Eric Vincent so we can keep talking all season long. And hopefully next time we come back here, man, hopefully we'll come back with a win. It's been a lot of losing in the Detroit sports world, especially with the Pistons right now. But hopefully, hopefully soon we'll turn it around. I'll be right back here soon enough with another update right here from the DSN News Desk. Peace.